feel the danger that makes you want to hide when the cards are stacked against you and you're standing right on, on beat mm. now's the time now's the time think about all the dreams you keep inside think about all the ones you love i know this Happy Monday, everybody. Hello. Hello. Oops. Hey, I got sunburned yesterday. Really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't know if I was the only one, but like I had a big old V neck sunburn. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I uh, spent all day outside. I mm. think there's a connection beneath the day star. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. It, it was pretty bright out there. Yeah. SPF next time. Uh, hey, what's the uh, prog on uh, uh, the the construction? Uh, had a conversation today. Um, steel building has been started first, mm -hmm. but will probably end after. So they're saying really it what because they oh, wow. custom order they what they do is they send all the specs and then everything gets pre manufactured and cut exactly to spec and then it shows up as a kit. Right. Um, I was worried. Remember, I mentioned I was worried that that I was too late to get the windows installed. Sure. They said it doesn't matter if you want to wait to do like the way you do windows is you cut out the holes and stick in the windows. Sure. So so we're fine on that. Um, so they're saying eight weeks to 10 weeks i think that they i think they just told you yeah you can put windows into a wall at any point well but, 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 but being, being a steel thing you think the stakes are different right you know or 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 considering the entire building is prefabbed and cut at the factory you would sure. think that it would make more sense to cut window holes there you know so but apparently that's not how they do windows oh. uh and then they're uh we're looking at 10 days and the septic people start put stuff in and uh, like next week, they start doing demo on the on the main house. Okay. And uh, I think what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do uh, minimum viable product to start. Get the cabinets, you know, like whatever. Throw some cabinets in there. Throw some whatevers. And then once we have a canvas, then the project becomes on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, inviting you know who wants to who wants to have a say in how X, Y, and Z looks. We did we did unbox a certain set of armor which was far more legitimate than I remember it being. Like what's Oh, 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 the attack knight? No, yeah. no, no, no. There's you, you you know where that thousand dollars in shipping went, Brian, when you when it you went into bubble wrap. a full suit of armor. Uh yeah, no, I felt much less bad about shipping it when I saw just how legit everything was. Like I, I would love to know what the original buyer paid for everything. It it had to be thousands plural of dollars. All I know is this. That was at the phase that Teasdale uh was making his first big paycheck from Amazon and his other expenditures were having a limo guy on call so he could just spend uh, uh, random nights just going through San Francisco in a limousine. Wow. No kidding. John yeah. Teasdale. Uh, and that way, because he was really into, uh, I forget if it was Clash or Drinking. during the end of the night, but the, some adult scavenger hunt thing. And so he would like uh, uh, plus plus his game by having a uh, a limo guy that On he would call. be the coolest guy. He would immediately be the coolest guy playing the game because you could jump in his limo. Wow. You are muted, Andrew. Andrew, you're muted. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh-oh. So I can see it on Skype. Yeah. Oh, no, I was watching your Brian's construction to had me go play the Simpsons clip of, uh, I don't know if I see I can play it for you here. Um, hold on one second. I got to turn up the volume on. <laughs> the Homer, like, oh, the, Homer in built. the medieval Doeth? 
Yeah, the, like ha- <laughs> that's a fine barn, but that's no pool English. Oh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. They raised the barn. Yeah. All right, you guys yeah. want to do a weird things show? Let's yeah. do it. Cool. Then take it away, Andrew. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Oh, hi, everybody. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Oh, hello, friends. And Brian Brushwood. Oh, my God, a whole week. A whole week of not doing South by Southwest. It was great. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, a week. A week's an interesting length of time. What would be, if you had to do an endurance stunt for a week... That would maybe you knew would get some attention. What would you do for a week? Oh wow! So we we are talking about in in the David Blaine style uh, of of uh, like something that would attract attention. Are we thinking about something that will uh, attract attention and cut through the clutter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the first thing that pops into mind is flagpole sitting. Uh, which all of a sudden I realized I have no idea what the world record for flagpole sitting is. Do you, do you, uh, before we check, Justin, do you have do you have a guess what the world record is? Uh, nor nor do I know what level of Harvey danger we'd need to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that uh, I mean that I, I guess that was a fad during the uh, Roaring Twenties. Was that and packing bodies into a phone booth, and uh, uh, but 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 sitting up on a flagpole was a was a popular stunt. Well, that was that that was contemporary to like dance marathons, right? Yeah, I guess uh, uh, see how long you could Charleston. Um, yeah. I, I, all I know about that is that it was a, a popular form of entertainment in the uh, uh, Great Depression because it just took forever. Like there was just everybody was really excited about something that passed time because yeah. everybody was poor. I mean, I, I, I could have sworn it was during the Roaring Twenties, which would have been before the Great Depression. The opposite. OK, well, then, uh, then maybe maybe dance marathons came after with them. Yeah. Oh, that's right. BioCow brings up stuffing a VW bug. That's that's one that we saw uh, more recently. Um, Flagpole sitting in the 1920s was a major part of the decade. Died out after 1929. Okay. So so here, uh, do we have a guess on what the longest flagpole sitter was? Uh, uh, no, no. It, it, please reset what a flagpole sitter is. Because, it's, it's quite literally uh, a flagpole, and usually there would be, as I understood it, like a, an eight inch by eight inch thing at the top, and you would just sit there, and it was an endurance stunt. Uh, Kind of like David Blaine's thing, only you actually had to engage your core. Unlike David Blaine's thing, where you just laid around and looked like a hobo for 30 days. Uh, well, yeah, that was in the box, right? Yeah. Because didn't, didn't, he did stand on something once. Uh, probably. I, I'm told he is capable of standing. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've also heard such rumors. Uh so uh, uh, yeah, I have I, I man I I have no idea. Literally, when you said flagpole sitting, I I thought you were making a joke about the Harvey Danger song. Well, no, no, no. Wait, wait, which that song is a reference to, uh, you know, to 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 the practice of flagpole sitting. Sure, yeah, and and to be honest, at the point that that song was was out, I had no clue what it without it was a reference to anything. Nobody other than did. It was provocative. Percent. Nobody knew. <laughs> uh, all right. Do we do we have any uh, any I, any information I'm gonna on guess, long a flagpole sitter? I'm gonna guess forty two hours. Brian Here, like 42 here's hours. here's okay. the problem with flagpole sitting, and I have answers to this. Is that there's I'm gonna sit on the edge of the pole. Then there's people who've sat on platforms. Right. Mm-hmm. And and, yeah. and a, a platform thing isn't the same as having to keep your core strength up because a platform can just be. I'm just gonna curl up and take a nap here and just not roll off. Uh. Still fairly impressive to this guy, <laughs> but, but, but so, so whether it's a, let, let's say, assuming it's either a platform or a, uh, a pole. All right, Brian, I know what you're getting at. Everybody dial up all your media contacts. Come on, come all. Brian Brushwood will be debuting his brand new compound on the Austin city limits by uh, breaking the world record for flagpole sitting. Well, specifically playing Hearthstone while sitting on a flag flagpole. I figure that's a very hey, small. Hey, don't give away the whole show. Brian. Okay, all right. <laughs> don't give away the whole show. We're just uh, we're getting them. We're building the tip here. Everybody's gonna get on in, and everyone's gonna watch the magnificent, amazing uh, Brian Brushwood flagpole sitting, uh, once thought to be a lost art, on his track. Travels throughout uh, uh, Indochina. Brian Brushwood revived <laughs> the uh, flagpole sitting 
uh, experience. So uh, uh, what, what we don't know is how long he will last. Uh, uh, you, uh, Brian has has threatened to go as long as forty eight hours. <laughs> should should uh, should I mention that the pole's only four feet tall? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 okay. They're making these phones bigger and bigger, huh? What, what, there, well, there are no rules to flag. I'm just saying there is no. Uh, we may have to start the official flagpole sitting committee. Okay. Because I, I hereby call this meeting to order of the flagpole sitting authority. Right. Yeah, it doesn't look like get, this is something Guinness keeps track of. But yeah. there, there, I found a few things on Wikipedia that might be considered records. So, Brian, you said 48 hours? I said 42. 42 uh, hours? J okay. Justin, do you have a guess? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would push it around there. I would say 48, yeah. Andrew, do you know? Yeah, I know. I, I'd look into this before, and and, and thus the whole. It, it's it's complicated. It, it's, it's it's way. I, it's uh, it's it's absurdly long because once you change it from, I'm on a pole to I'm got kind of a little platform here, and Brian is Brian dismissed. But there is a very big difference between trying to balance yourself and having basically a treehouse on a pole, and how long you can endure up there. So one of the early records in 1924 was 13 hours. Uh, not long after, that record became 12, 17, and then 21 days. What? Uh, let's see. In 1930, another record was set for 51 days, 20 hours. Man, that's not real. Like you, you, uh, you've got you've got uh, working plumbing. Richard, you have a shower up there. Uh, see, Brian, when I pointed this out, you're like, "Oh, but I still hold this." You well, no, no, no. you said you set up valiant flagpole sitters. <laughs> you 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 set a, a not a, all sitters. A, a platform. Uh, it depends on the size. If you're talking about the platform, the size of, of of a double wide trailer, then that's significantly different than the eight inch by eight inch platform I described at the beginning of this. These are these are the records like the records like two hundred days. Yeah, so in... Oh, my God, really? Right. In 1964, a record of 217 days was set by Peggy Townsend Clark. Uh, and then... The, the, and then I don't know if you've seen this one here from the 80s, Andrew. David Gidge? Uh, he, uh, David Werder. H. Oh. David Werder. Oh, man, uh, household names, legends. In a protest against the price of gasoline, he <laughs> sat atop a pole for... 439 days, 11 hours, and 6 oh, wow. minutes. Now, in your face, Carter! Uh, isn't there also, like in the 1970s, an iteration of, of billboard sitting? Like people who would get up and protest protest by just hanging out on billboards? Which sounds uh, closer to the uh, 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 the creature comforts that uh, Andrew was no, describing. I, I, no, I, 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 I definitely yeah. have seen people protesting uh, uh, billboards and stuff like that. I, I just like the idea the guys up on top of the pole or platform or whatever, you know, has to, you know, use a bucket and living in a stupid pole. And he's like, man, those Exxon guys, I'm going to get them. And oh, imagine the boardroom uh, uh, where they're like, oh, you know, we got to raise price three cents. Like, yeah, the guy's on. He's been on the pole for four yeah. months, guys. Oh, dude. Imagine how he's like sitting up there. He's like, oh, those Exxon guys. I'll bet you that they're just so mad right now. I'm embarrassing them so much. Oh, I bet you they got steams coming out of their ears. That's how you know, smash cut to, uh, of all of the Exxon executives cheating on their wives and smoking cigars. Like, <laughs> We need to crash another boat, guys. Oil prices are too low. <laughs> Where's that drunk captain? <laughs> All right, so Brian, are you in? Are, are we are we doing the uh, a, a a flagpole sitting demonstration to open the compound? I mean, five hundred days of flagpoles. Uh, Let's uh, do it. You know what? You can start uh, going now. Get, and by get, the time that all the renovations were done, you have to shoot all the episodes up there. I mean, if, 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 you want to, if you want to spoil the ending, uh, we're using pole-based technology to build everything on the new compound. So there's going to be like a giant game of floor is hot lava. I'm just going to hop from pole to pole. Yeah. I'll not touch ground for a year. <laughs> I, I have an idea, a radical idea. I'm trying to find... Um, let me see if I can find. Um... <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. Bear I'm with me. Brush away these uh, mundane. Uh, Brian stands on a flagpole for 500 days. Ideas, so we can get to the real spice. All right. Let me see. Uh, I'm gonna find this. I have a solution, Brian. 
Okay. All right. Um, okay. Moon shoes. Well, not we technically is... touching well, the ground. I mean, actually, hold on. If I just affix a number of poles to my shoes, uh, yeah. aka yeah. stilts. Yeah. Stilts, yeah. But, uh, well, yeah, I was thinking, I was looking to find the opposite of Austin, Texas, because we could just stick a pole in the ground there, an upside down pole. It basically oh. used the, the pole plus the entire earth, and there you are. An it's earth pretty good. Pop it's pretty plan, good. Yeah. You know, because, like, if we have, like, we see technically, the all of size, Austin. Is, how about the size of the earth? I mean, technically, all of Austin is just a big platform on the other side of the earth's pole to uh, this section of the Pacific or Who's that Atlantic or that? Indian Ocean. I, guess I don't know geography. This person in Austin. Yeah, it is nowhere. I mean, like, this is where, like, you lose Malaysian jetliners and lost. <laughs> yeah um, you know what uh yeah not, not that you can verify it but I, I now i do remember i did put a poll there i what? definitely put a poll there and in fact i've already begun i've been doing it for 795 days what? Brian, why did you tell that us explains podcast? why you've been playing hearthstone <laughs> <laughs> uh, brian why didn't you just tell us this before um we're your friends yeah well you know uh, uh I, I forgot I was very busy. We're going to have to have a conversation, Brian, about okay. this. So this this seems like something that definitely got swept away because people just killed the record by making them really, really, really boring records now, that aren't. Well, and like, the only way to make them safe was to, oh, my god. So this is the 200-plus day. I see you sent this. This is a link to Peggy's uh, poll, and it is, this is a treehouse. Yeah, that's a treehouse yeah, with privacy. It's got a lad on it. <laughs> yeah. she's, she's pooping in a bucket in the back there. That's, yeah. There's a roof. <laughs> it does have a roof. That It seems like that should be... I mean, look, I, I know we were joking around. We were horsing off before about uh, creating the flagpole sitter's authority, but I feel like we should, and we, we should be separating these things into... Uh, uh, divisions. Uh, we should have our own games done quick. Uh, 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 polls done, sat on uh, uh, weekend where we stream everything. We stream different kinds of records. What would you say? What would you guys want uh, the different divisions to be? Certainly, the treehouse division obviously is is there. Uh, what are what are the restrictions that uh, uh, Brian you would like to see for other? Flag uh, well, I mean, for the pro league, I'd like to see the umbrella top academy where it's like you sit on a folded closed umbrella and just you know you, you take turns sitting one cheek on it and then you oh, switch so you're to balancing the, other cheek. the umbrella up too oh what yeah, we... yeah no, no no i mean the the, the umbrella is mounted i'm saying you've got that that mm, like it's it's tight okay we should we should like the record should be you divide the area you're sitting on or number of days by the amount of area you're sitting on uh, okay. okay oh so you could have it be as big as you want but it's going to be a long record yeah. the sitter is yeah. constant and yeah. so if you are, if let's say it's just a, a pole with like a flat, like it's literally just the, the circumference of the pole that it's flat and you are like pigeon towing on, on top of, then that's like the minimum that you could possibly have. All that time counts as clean. Mm -hmm. But if you have a, even a little bit of a surface area that you can put both your feet down, now you're, you're taking time off the clock. Well, and uh, I'll tell you what, now all of a sudden I'm realizing you, you put up a single wide trailer up on a pole and then you give birth to a child who never knows anything but living in that. <laughs> and you can go for a very long time. A very long time. That's a world champion right there. There sure. we go. I'll tell you what. You might the have pole. To... <laughs> Loop <You might> pole. Have... <laughs> now, all right. What about a division where people throw things at you? Oh. Projectiles. Heckler an division. division. Yeah. Where it's yeah. like you also have to get, do stand up comedy or a three hour radio show every single day. And then <laughs> yeah, people whatever, just... whatever you want. Like, I mean, you get obviously this is where you have your real showmen uh, are, are there so they can really perform. But, but the idea is that all comers can throw things at you. What, what, the, it's got to be limited to fruit or. Veg tomatoes. It's, it's tomatoes gotta be only. Hand league. thrown though. Hand thrown. No t-shirt cannons. Sure. I mean, certainly no firearms. That's right out. Like, but <laughs> yes. but uh, I'm gonna throw no some bullets at you. I mean, yeah, you, you're still in the realm of like you know somebody tossing uh, a grapefruit and you just you, you you're taking a Louisville Slugger and just knocking it up there at them. Oh, oh I mean, yeah, that what could be think? pretty rough. But a bat or is that is that mechanical? That's help? the home run derby league. I mean, that's a well. That's a derby you can league. offset that by getting a bunch of air mattresses and setting them around the bottom. <laughs> so now it's safe if you do fall. 
So you probably wouldn't reason... want to do air mattresses for safety. Well, okay, but... you have air mattresses, and then to handle the bounce, you have uh, regular mattresses. Yeah, so We're outside both mattresses. The, the 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 committee decrees. Yeah. So the point I want to get to is actually is we have another <laughs> record to talk about, which is, uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, Jack Wilmot. He, Legend. He... Uh, the founder Jack of Studio Disrupt VR. He spent 168 consecutive hours. He spent a week in a VR headset. Uh, okay, which which one? Um, is it, it is it a like... Vive? Are we talking Pimax? Because that's that's a feat if if you're holding that giant thing. Uh, he used an Oculus, and then he switched to like an Untethered when he had to. Um, eat or whatever but he basically was an oculus and so he closed his eyes when he switched headsets he live streamed the whole thing on twitch hmm. and uh said that it was you know kind of an experiment but it's great if you're into if you're a vr promoter and you want to do something cool great is, gimmick great is bit. it is it um is it is that a great gimmick is that how we want people to I'm, perceive I'm, vr i'm reading about i'm reading about him and his vr company right now i would say yeah I, it, we are, yeah, we are giving him press. That's what he wanted, right? But, this but, is, but, but, are we are we breathlessly discussing him with deep admiration? And, is that your sense? Of, is that your point <laughs> of failure? Is if you don't reach your emotional point there? I no, mean, I think uh, that, well, specifically, uh, it seems to me like if you wanted to generate a lot of press about your VR thing, it would be about how easy it is, not what a monumental achievement it is to wear this 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 uh, 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 medieval torture looking device on your so, face but, for a week so, so right now what we're looking at is him watching something render yeah like he's this, looking at a premiere window rendering so he's not even so, playing a game the whole time he was doing some he was doing some work with just that that emulation there right there in, in front of his face in vr looks like it yeah let's see he has some games. He plays. He plays a virtual bus. The uh, the, the bus. Is that Desert Bus? He played he, VR Desert Bus. Yeah, he played VR Desert Bus. It looks like for four, five, six days. So most of this right, is back, Desert back, Bus. Back to your point, Andrew. I don't know that this is the the exactly the type of press I want for VR. If I want to promote VR, yeah, I mean, for his his goal is not to promote VR. His goal is say, hey, I'm going to do an interesting experiment with VR. What do I find out? And he got coverage everywhere. And if you're going from zero to all of a sudden a week later, you're the guy. I Conferences, all of this sort of stuff. This guy spent a week in VR. He's now put himself into the conversation in a very public way. And so I'm saying, like, I mean, it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant and, because. Yeah. I, I agree. Anybody who's booking a VR speaker, he is going to have. Because other than I own a VR company or I develop for VR, everybody's just like, I like it. I'm a fan. I really like doing it. Like, there's no VR celebrities. There's no super big VR Twitch streamers that, that consistently get big numbers. So all of a sudden, he has totally cut himself out beyond the pack as I am more familiar with VR than anybody else you're going to read in a, you know, the, the, the brochure of speakers that are speaking today. Well, so, so what were the what were the big enlightening takeaways that we got from this? He said that when he took off the, the goggles, he was relieved. He says, man, the graphics in reality are much better. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it, it's he, he was an interesting him talking about what what he got used to. He said sleeping was easier than he thought. You know, he said it was easier to sleep than he expected it to be. You know, there was the, the, a brightness issue, whatever. But, you know, um, I think, you know, like. You know, you know, he's a he's a filmmaker. He's not a guy. Oh, pardon me. He's not a guy developing hardware. He's a guy who wants to get into content and whatnot. And I think as far as I'm, I'm like, I think it's I think it's brilliant. You know, um, you know, because congratulations, this guy's now gets to be the guy who did the thing. And yeah, he is certainly the guy who did the thing, without yeah. a doubt. That is a uh, uh, cheers, kings to him. Uh, that that he is the guy that spent a week in, in in virtual reality, but and I have a feeling that like I don't know twenty years from now he'd be like, what only a week? It'll be like well, what I haven't taken off mine in three years. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know? to be honest, the biggest the biggest thing that I uh, that I would say for him is, uh, uh, man, I want to know what uh, uh, pad that he has uh, <laughs> that, that, that seals around his eyes because that's 
you know, if, if I do it for more than uh, uh, an hour or so, like I, I'm already getting irritation around my uh, my my the, the the mask line. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's uh, I guess it just strikes me as a bit odd for something that uh, their goal should be to make it as easy to go three years at a time as possible to sing the praises uh, of, of somebody who made it a week because because I'm with you. It's like uh, like I've worn these glasses for two whole years. I've never looked at anything without them. It's like, well, that, like that that should be closer to where we're at on VR. Well, yeah. go ahead. But, uh, yeah, I'm thinking again, he's he's a filmmaker. He's a VR filmmaker, whatever. And so he's an artist. And so he's approaching it from an artist's point of view and not somebody who says, ah, I make great tech or I make this. He's like, ah, let me do an experiment with myself. Uh, what's his name? Jack Wilmot. Jack Wilmot. Got I did say it earlier, but that's okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you what uh, I'm going to say right now, and that is patreon.com slash weird things is where you can support this show. If you head on over there right now to patreon.com slash weird things, you can uh, kick us in a little, uh, you know, a buck or two. I'm going to throw a dollar right at our face. Here's the deal. When you are a patron, you get your custom RSS feed that gets you early access to After Things. That is the show we do after weird things, wherein... We discuss a lot of business stuff. If you're a creator, a maker, an entrepreneur, you want to ask a question, this is the time that you can do it, and you get that access right there on your phone. It's so easy with these custom RSS feeds. I swear. Patreon.com slash weird things. All right. Another uh, tech thing relating to this is that let's say you're in VR and you want to talk to your friends in VR. Um, you know, having some sort of avatar or having something that, you know, does that for you is ideal. But if you've got your face in this headset, it's not like you can put a camera in front of you here. Or there are times where we want to talk to people and maybe we just want to speak, but we don't want to go on camera. I mean, I wear my hat because, like, you know, my hair is usually, you know, all over the place. I don't want to frighten anybody. You know, if I could have a, a virtual Andrew, probably be better. Have you seen the new Facebook tech they're working on for, for creating your own avatar in real time? No. Oh. Uh, so I, 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 the closest I had heard of was there are, uh, what, Vive improvements that involve like uh, um, uh, eye tracking so that it, uh, for the user, it shifts the focus to whatever they're looking at. But I would imagine that would have applications for virtual avatars so that you're able to get things like those subtle facial cues that, that mean so much to us in nonverbal communication. Yeah, so they've got a demo up of their new uh, realistic face tracking avatars, and they're really good. They're not there there yet, but you know we're we're better off than you know late you know uh, early two thousands you know computer generated movies you know Polar Express. I think it's better than Polar Express. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so wow. we're watching I, that is a pretty guy good. A, wow, con having a conversation. Wanted to give us the play by play. Yeah, so we're seeing two people have a conversation, and each of them are looking like um, uh, the genie from uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse, uh, just sort of floating <laughs> heads. Mika licka hi, mika hiney ho. Uh, but 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 they're they're rendered really well. I mean, they do have ever so slightly kind of like the what you notice is that the smiles don't seem to exactly track mm -hmm. because those obviously aren't being seen by the gear. Uh, but I assume they're being implied by watching, you know, like eye lines tighten. And and they're they're sort of estimated, but but that looks like a, a very credible. Uh, I uh, you could have a significant valuable conversation with someone like this. This is a stunning and vicious rebuke of Rogue One. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah these uh you know the eyes are a little bit. You you look at the eyes and the mouth, and you can kind of tell. But. These are things that get better, you know, as we've seen with just algorithms and like deep fakes and stuff like this is that it's just it's, you know, uh, somebody doing a two weekend project to figure out, you know, and that was a big problem for years and eyes was, you know, CGI eyes was that people treated them just like kind of reflective glass balls or whatever without really understanding how eyes work. And that's why eyes looked weird. And then now eyes look way, way better in CG and here trying to do this and map the face. And, you know, you look at. You know, we showed before, like on iOS, the fa the 3D face renderer, you know, and how you can just that camera, the camera on the front of your iPhone is capable of getting a 3D image of your face that you can look at it from different angles. And that tech's only going to get better. 
this is really disturbing. We're looking at people doing like going through the mouth ranges, you know. Rawr, rawr, rawr. <laughs> uh, it does. It does look like the uh, uh, the showing your work on the fact that there are just going to be like either digital or physical replicants built of us, right? Like this, this is like, this would be shown in with like creepy horror music. If we were to uh, discover this in some hidden cache after we understand that the robots have won. Yeah. So, I mean, so my question is uh, right now, if I had a good enough avatar, would it be okay if I told you guys like, yeah, I'll do the show, but I'm just going to use my avatar instead of my, stupid voice face i mean uh, 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 to be to be totally honest i think there are a lot of opportunities to do that and we've we've kind of seen as skype has continued to get bigger uh even in broadcast television more of that become the standard but uh, i don't think that we're at the final form of i don't have good video or i would rather have passable interesting video combined with very good audio uh yeah, no, I think we could, I could at a certain level of uh, of photorealism, I think a, a Andrew Avatar would be great. I mean, <laughs> hey, keep keep in mind, given our recent history as far as bandwidth goes, I think that some of us might be giddy at the at the thought of an always <laughs> present uh, Andrew yeah. Avatar. But but yeah, the I chat room's like, yeah, it'll have you know better con internet connection than I do. <laughs> well, and of course, we're not the best example because um, a lot of people listen just by audio only, and and um, but like think about even a broadcast television thing in a world where all your sports channels are increasingly just throwing you know radio programs on the air, and it's not really important how everything looks. Um, I can totally imagine a uh, a talk celebrity who happens to show up on video, maybe, uh, I don't know, like having an accident or whatever, and, you know, maybe uh, maybe even a disfiguring accident, and he just announces, or he or she just announces, uh, yeah, you know what, for a while I'm just going to have this avatar be my thing. And at some point they forget that it's an avatar. It becomes like a prosthetic, basically, because it's like, you guys would all rather think of me the way I think of me, and uh, and here I am as the way all of us think of me. I'll, I'll tell you, that that actually is fascinating, uh, uh, we certainly saw in the advent of HD, there was this uh, uh, worry that like, oh, my God, now all of a sudden, as 4K and HD become the norm, everyone's going to look older. People are going to be able to age gracefully less and less. We saw some people, you know, most notably kind of uh, uh, Barbara Walters, who had always used some element of, you know, big soft gauzy, soft. Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, filters. Now that was even more of a thing. But. Uh, what the example that I'm thinking of specifically is remember when um, uh, uh, Roger Ebert had his lower jaw removed. Um, yeah. Like uh, at that point, imagine, uh, you know, it was a big deal when they were able to recreate his voice synthetically. But now we're at the point where they could not only recreate his voice synthetically, but also recreate his face. And, and he's like, hey, it's still me. Like, imagine he's still writing, writing all his reviews. And it's like uh, we're just, you know, using prosthetics. So it's as comfortable for you as possible to still watch me do my thing. That is fascinating. That would be a fascinating thing to look at him to do. I mean, geez, think of it like this even. Let's just go. I mean, obviously, uh, Ebert has since passed on. But let's take all the reviews that he wrote, which he did for years and years after he left television, and just say, now we're going to take the, the movies that are the best, right? That That's still, you know, we, we would want a uh, uh, the, the, the Ebert take on it. And you just create the lost Ebert monologues. You do a YouTube channel or something that is just a, a computer generated version using that algorithm that or, the, or that voice that he used toward the end of his life. And now we get heretofore unseen yet written by the man, uh, although not delivered by the man Ebert monologues. That'd well, and, and what's weird is, is that it would be so good that I feel like the debate would instantly shift from whether or not this is a fair representation of Robert Ebert, because they were his words, his reviews, he, he put them out there. And I think we would instantly start arguing about which of them aged better and which of them, you know, because he didn't like Fight Club when it first came out. And I think uh, I would like to believe that if he was still around, he would see more of the value of that movie at that time. Uh, I, I think we'd be busy arguing about what he got wrong in his reviews and less focused on the, the di digital prosthesis that made them possible. I don't you know. know. Yeah. That, well, that, I mean, that, I'd be curious. 
it brings up another interesting idea that too is it's when you have very very large data sets like all of roger ebert's reviews and you have movies you could in theory put them you know have an ai look at the reviews and look at the movies and it would, it would be more consistent than most reviewers would be any us included because but that's another interesting thing it's like you could you could probably at a certain point you know, I mean, you have to pre-train it on something else, but you could you could build a thing that could say, Would "I watched the movie for you. This is what you think." Or, or, or at uh-huh. least, or at least pass a Turing test, right? At yeah. least pass the point where, like, yeah, I believe that's the kind of thing Roger Ebert would have said about this movie. Yeah, uh, I just saw. I was looking through footage of a a fan used an AI algorithm to up-res Deep Space Nine into HD. How does it look? Uh, I'm probably just going to show them if you find this, and and that's that's another thing that's being done now is that if you have pre-trained networks to understand how things look, you can actually increase up-res stuff, and you know it, it's up-resing technology is getting really, really, really good. Yeah, well, especially because even though let's say you only have 320 by 240 pixels to work with, you've got to remember you have you know, uh, 29.97 uh, uh, of them per second to work with. And you can, from a single pixel pixel interpret, let's say, especially if it's a static locked off shot, that variation in color range as you deal with heat shimmer and wind and debris and, and whatever it is, uh, gives you a range and that's all data. And, you know, we look at these uh, NASA photos, um, none of uh, virtually, it, if you're seeing something pretty from NASA, it almost... A hundred percent is not the way the camera saw it or the visual visual uh, the human eye would see it were you there it's uh it's always you know pieced together from a whole bunch of different data sets wow this does look pretty good it's a little uh, hard to tell with the way that we have this set up this monitor is a little smaller resolution and then it's not the full youtube size um he has some other images on his blog that are still images um of uh, so you've got the original, you've got an original frame here and an up-res 1080 frame here. Wow. That's pretty, that's pretty good detail uh, being caught. Uh, I think we've had another, this is from the title sequence uh, and then the, uh, the original or the full size. Man. I mean, it makes sense. Why, why, why wouldn't, you know, an algorithm mm-hmm. be able to figure out, you know, give or take what it looked like? Or what well, you know, it would have looked like. Show you something else pretty cool. If you look at, uh, there's a site remove.bg, and they, it's an AI background remover. And we yeah. see that even with Skype, they can do the blur or whatever, but it's not quite good. But I just I just grabbed a photo of Justin uh, and just from the live stream. And let me see if I can, uh, I don't know if I want to. Oh, I can email it to Bryce. Here, you um, you keep talking. I will find uh, an example. Yeah. But anyhow, it, you know, this stuff is really, really good now at like removing backgrounds. Like you can, and you can do this. Imagine you shoot a film. You don't even wa- worry about the green screen. You use a really high resolution camera and you shoot your film. And then you're like, ah, let's just change the background because the AI is getting really good at figuring out, you know, um, uh, what is yeah i use one for the live stream oh. yeah but it's amazing that just just grabbed it right there but i just took one of justin and sitting in the environment he's in right now mm-hmm. that's crazy yeah i i screwed around with that a little bit or, or, or something similar a, a while ago because i was looking for something to do that kind of just removal without uh, uh having to do the the fairly tedious photoshop you know cutting out stuff but uh oh my god yeah that's yeah that's even more intense than what i remember the 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 tools that I remember you had to actually like draw like uh, uh, the background and like draw the foreground, like just somewhat, but this just popped it right out and with fairly uh, insane precision. Well, yeah, like to the tune of individual clumps of hair, uh, mm-hmm. uh, perfectly extracted. That, yeah. that That's where you can see a lot of some of the smoothing, especially kind of on the hairline here. But even then uh, it knows that it's better to kind of cut into that and smooth it out afterwards than so the beard, the beard, the details on the beard come out pretty good. Cause there's good separation. I but sent yeah. you, uh, I sent you one taken from the background he's in front of right now, just to sure. give you an example of when it's not this really, you know, nice depth of field. That's not bad. Oh, you got yeah. a little bit of artifacting here. You can see a little bit more of the, uh, 
bit mm-hmm. of the background, background on the white shirt. But that's a screen yeah. grab from a Skype video. You know, I mean, that's, you know, to give an example. I mean, that's pretty damn good. Yeah, you know, yeah. it has to figure out the microphone and stuff. But, yeah. So. So I guess future I guess space. the uh, the the future uh, futurist question is like how comfortable are we going to be with increasingly digitally manufactured representations of of people? I mean we're we're already to a place where you go to a concert and you know um, maybe maybe a, an aging celebrity can't hit those high notes and so uh, there's software that detects the moment you're you're starting to squeak out at at this high C and then just you know it just crossfades it into the backing vocal corrected track. Like I think we're all okay with that. Uh, why not a step farther? Why not? Why not the entire presences? You know, we had a couple phenomena that happened. I think in both in the 1990s, which were sort of interesting, and that was that as we became more aware of, let's say, music click track or whatever the technology was at the time for music, and then you had on you had uh, in. I would say, like, in Magic, we watched David Blaine come out, where David Blaine, you know, you're thinking, like, how can you do Magic on TV in this age? And that was a problem for David Copperfield doing Big Illusions, is everybody knew about CGI and stuff. Not that that's how he did it, but you just sort of assumed anything you saw on TV could be done. And that's when you had to use reality TV elements for David Blaine. Is it shot like a documentary? It reality. It wasn't the sl- slickly produced thing. You felt that it was just, oh, a camera on the street. For music, you had MTV Unplugged which was, you know, hey, we know there's all this tech and all that. We're just going to show up with our guitars and our instruments, and we're going to play in front of you and show you that we're real musicians. And there was a lot of value there. Yeah, so I suppose we we move the bar. I, I wonder if some ways uh, this is something that Twitch is extremely well positioned to take advantage of. Um, maybe there's a there's a craving to go back to the electricity of a live performance and, and doing stuff live to tape or live, period. Well, but I think that there's there's a line, right? Like nobody ever went at the height of Britney Spears' fame. Nobody ever went to a Britney Spears concert because she was the greatest vocalist of a generation, right? Like she was she was a pop star. You wanted to be there for a spectacle, and uh, she was an a, an icon. So if Britney Spears gets auto tuned until the day she dies, as long as that means that people can go see her and 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 experience something that either has them relive their childhood or, or something like that, then I think that they're going to be fine. Similarly, we've now seen uh, the entire career trajectory of somebody who understood that uh, a vocal enhancement could be something that uh, separated him from the pack in T-Pain. That we're on, we're on the other end of, like, T-Pain is a tremendously talented singer. He became famous for doing these pop songs where he was auto-tuned beyond recognition to his speaking voice. And now you, he was the entire hook of the, the, the Fox Mass Singer show where it was like, oh, my God, T-Pain can really sing. Isn't this a crazy concept? Uh, uh, so we're, we're, we're kind of already there in terms of using these tools. But I think the lesson is we're not going to make any rules about the tools. Like if it works for a certain person, that's fine. Uh, uh, I think we would have rather... Frank Sinatra live out his final years being able to take advantage of some of these vocal sweetening uh, things as, as as opposed to, you know, how he was in his latter years where he's just kind of joking through half the songs because he can't hit the iconic notes. And yeah, I think we're going to see these tools get so good that like anybody will be able to create music with it, but you're still going to have to have good ideas, good presentation. Yeah. So. You know, but I also think like on the other side of it that being able to perform live with just a guitar or piano or whatever is still going to be, you know, that'll be a, another draw. Like that's how ta- and that and this day you think about like there are certain singers and people we gravitate towards is like you go Adele, like she's amazing. You know, yeah. she's just just, you know, they're they're, you know, thinking of it, you know, this, a number of others. You just go like, oh, yeah, you hear them live or whatever. and They're just phenomenal. And so we still put value on that. Certainly yeah. so. And that will always be that that will be in the. uh you know, the, the, the more impressive uh, uh, that they, they would be like the flagpole sitters of singing uh, yeah. uh, uh, without the a flagpole platform. singers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any picks? Oh, uh, man. So yeah, I got I got a pick here for you. Uh, uh, this is actually a Bryce pick. Oh, oh, wait, just wait. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Somebody want to know, do we all remember Looker? Looker was a Michael Crichton movie uh, about they create they start killing off models and uh 
Is Basically, because the they're one, replacing him with di- what's that? Is this the one where like the girl's getting scanned and there are pluses all over her naked body and she goes help rape and then they say that and and they're like please stop moving and it's like it's just a joke. Uh, that's I think that's the first time I ever heard the word rape <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, Michael Crichton is brilliant, but you watch the trailer. This movie does not. It's the the concept great. The idea is that like. Some technology company is going around scanning the most beautiful models in the world and is creating virtual models. This is like from 1979, 1980, or just something really. 81, it said, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but this woman shows up and asks for help. She She's supposed to get plastic surgery. She's like, I can't have, I need you to make me less pretty because they're going to kill me because I'm too beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, they're so they start killing off all these models they've scanned. Oh, yeah. So oh, once they have so the backup they, copy, so they, uh, oh, dude, yeah. this is the movie I was thinking of. Yeah. Yep. 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 <sighs> Ages <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, before parental restrictions on cable. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Great. Great mention in the chat room. Great mention for that. Look. So, yeah. Uh, all right. This was a pick that Bryce uh, said a couple weeks ago. Uh, uh, but Ashley and I have really gotten into it. It's kind of become our like comfort show to watch right before we go to sleep. Shit's Creek. Mm, yeah. The, uh, pop. A uh, 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 pop original. And then I guess it, I'm assuming it aired somewhere in Canada primarily. Right. Yeah. I think pop is a Canadian is the Canadian channel. Oh, re- oh uh, there's also a pop in Canada. I know that it's also an American channel. Oh, uh, uh, then I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so this is, I don't know how many seasons. I'm, I'm only on the second season here, but uh, it, it, it seems to be a labor of love between uh, Eugene Levy and his son uh, that write uh, most of the episodes. But it is... It is definitely like like uh, uh, Bryce said. If uh, although there is a similar theme of like to like Arrested Development, where Arrested Development is a rich family that falls on hard times, and you kind of spend all your time laughing at how ridiculous they are. Certainly, there is a hint of that here, but it is more. It's got a little bit more uh, a heart to it, while being you know giving just such a great uh platform for the, the the four actors that play the family like they are just uh it, it is just kind of a master class including Catherine o'hara i mean who's just a treasure i mean like the fact that we get uh uh you know another just sort of like tour de force performance by her she is one of the funniest people uh uh funniest female you know comedians of, of all time and I'm i'm so glad that that she gets a showcase where she just chews up the screen uh, uh with this this hilarious character it's great yeah cool dude guys i can't this is the strongest recommendation i've given for anything in a long time uh i went and saw uh i went and saw apollo 11 and it was stunning beyond words uh it, it is a documentary from cnn documentaries um it is a documentary with no narration no interviews, no descriptions, no explanations. And it is all actual footage, uh, uh, you know, digitally remastered. And there's, you know, Foley work to, to make it more palatable. But you are there as they roll the Saturn V to its launch platform. You are there in the crowd with people as they're buying corn dogs on a stick and kids are, are sleeping and snoozing and fussing. You are there as, as uh, you know, Apollo 11 goes to the moon and comes back and it is amazing. The technical challenge of telling the entire story with nothing but a soundtrack and recreated audio of, of everything is makes this so electric and especially uh, Justin and I, we, we both really enjoyed uh, First Man. I guess all, all of us yeah. did. You liked it too, Bryce. Yeah, First Man uh, was pretty good. And uh, but, but as a companion piece, like once you've gone through the storytelling version of it, the fictionalized version of Neil Armstrong's story, which was already great because it really made you feel like you were there, mm. uh, to see the actual footage and be there, uh, like that moment, <laughs> the, the, the moments that the documentary helps you out 
are very subtle and very small, and they're usually with very small text that says things like amount of fuel left, and it expresses it in minutes. And you're watching Neil Armstrong land, and you watch, and you see, you hear the alarms going off that kept going off for no damned reason as they're landing, and you feel the tension. Uh, it's extraordinary. I I cried like three or four times during it. Pretty much any time they would sweep over crowd shots of people and you would realize how many people worked to make this astonishing engineering miracle happen uh it was it was just great beyond words i loved it very cool and that's in theory i did not know that this was like out or like i thought that because when you were texting me over the weekend i thought this was that hulu show that they canceled but this oh, is like no, 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 no. a yeah. theatrical release yeah, in it, theaters now worth seeing in yeah, a theater I'm, for I'm, sure. I'm, I'm i'm assuming that's qualifying for like award contention right is that you, you you give it you give a movie like this a run in in theaters uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you this much worth seeing in the theater like I don't know that the grandeur and that the quality of of uh, the the footage would really come through on any of the small screens that I own uh it's yeah. it's great and 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 strike it rich points out it's it's that film quality it's like this was shot in the, basically the same technology as you know uh, 2001 a space odyssey and as a result it, it holds up. Yeah, I will. I will say that was uh, the the most exciting part about First Man was understanding that you would feel <laughs> that the the, the 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 technology. What was the greatest technical achievement that man had uh, uh, exhibited was about as sophisticated as uh, you know grabbing a a tray from the cafeteria and sliding down a snowy hill. <laughs> like it was. <laughs> Uh, uh, just so ramshackle compared to w how we are ensconced in technology these days. And the men that were running, fighting, uh, uh, jockeying with each other to have the honor of uh, being the guys that that uh, achieved this goal, even after their compatriots had like died in front of them, uh, is remarkable and insane. I sent uh, Bryce a photo. I took this about uh, two weeks ago inside the vehicle assembly building, which is where they put the the rocket together. And you look at the external photos of the assembly building and how big it is. Then you get in there and you realize it's big and you realize there's a whole separate section on one side where the shuttle gets built. And you look like this is something built in the 60s and the scale of this building that was like the largest building by volume or whatever in the world it's insane and so i took a little i took a, a panoramic shot started on my feet going all the way up and back over this is just insane you look at the scale of this thing and it's you see these rockets are hard to judge the size of you know remember we walked into spacex and we saw that big thing coming out from the wall that looked like a truss or whatever and it's like it's a landing leg guys and we're like oh, oh yeah <laughs> Uh, you know. I'll, I'll tell you what, I don't normally uh, pr pretend to be able to predict uh, whether or not Andrew Maine will like a thing, but I, for the life of me, can't figure Like, there's no editorializing. It's just yeah. everything raw as it was, and you feel like you're there. I think you're going to love it, man. I, I think it's the, worth the, it to see in the theater. The trailer looks amazing, you know, and I heard, like, oh, watch this amazing foot. I'm like, I've seen all this, but I watched the trailer. I'm like, oh, that yeah. is good. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, you get to be there uh, uh, ostensibly as, and I'm sure it's not the exact same uh, uh, time that the astronauts were lifted, but but you get to be there for the entire elevator ride going up, and you get the mm. immensity of scale of the Saturn V rocket. Uh, it's, it's just great. Soundtrack, right. uh, d uh, double thumbs up on the soundtrack. Wonderful. Nice. Uh, I have a pick. Uh, I just finished playing this over the weekend, and it was a fun, like, little six six hour game or so uh it's called hypno space outlaw it's been uh, uh a little bit of a thing i saw on twitter you play as uh a uh, enforcer a volunteer enforcer on uh hypno space this uh online uh internet like service that people <laughs> access when they go to sleep so you go to sleep and you put this headband on and you get to go into Hypnospace, which is this very, it takes place at the end of 1999, and so it's all like, you know, uh, super compressed gifts, you can get a virtual pet, you get stickers and, and wallpapers, and, and you're going around taking these cases of like, hey, you know, we, uh, uh, we found that there are people, you know, posting, Ill, you know, uh, infringing content of this cartoon character, go and uh, uh, find it out, and, and we'll pay you Hypnocoin to... Uh, uh, to to you know be this enforcer and then there's a, a larger mystery kind of afoot 
but this thing is is really cool and it it leans really heavily onto like you know the 90s web geo cities aesthetic uh every they have like their own engine for building these web pages I was, I was about to say like just technologically i don't know how they pulled that off it it looks mm -hmm. so authentic yeah it's there there's a whole like i think they've got a web page builder that will uh makes a lot of this stuff easier and they just have a ton of gifs and and images almost every web page has auto playing music and so uh because they have their own audio engine also so people can make music in this in the site and uh, it's 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 a lot of fun uh, to kind of both have that experience of like, oh, yeah, I remember, you know, GeoCities and people kind of getting their first taste of the Internet. But also, um, I'm, I don't I'm not going to spoil any of the game, but you get to kind of see a little bit of progression in that stuff as, um, you know, uh, uh, as there's a this 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 relationship between the people who use the service and the people who run the service um, and how different uh you know different decisions on one side impact the other side and and vice versa it's it's a very cool thing and it's like it's like on sale because it just came out so uh this is super worth uh uh your time uh it's mostly a puzzle game also i didn't really talk about the game much but it's Excellent. basically a puzzle game so hypnospace outlaw sweet groovy yeah I guess it's my turn um uh, my pick is the Masters of Scale podcast by Reed Hoffman. I finished the book Blitzscaling, and uh, it's been a very interesting book about like scaling business. Masters of Scale, he interviews different people. You've got interviews with Mark Zuckerberg, Ev Williams, uh, the creator of Instagram, also the creator of Instagram, and other people talking about you know what they made, how they did it. A lot of really interesting stories come out, like in Instagram, like stuff I hadn't heard about about how when you know they're working on the first version of it and the the creator he shows his wife and she's like this is great but I'm not going to use it and he's like why she's like my photos don't look very good I wish they looked like our friend Craig's he's like well Craig uses filters she's like well could you have filters <laughs> he's like uh sure I guess if you want that <laughs> you know and it's just things like that you know Ev Williams talking about Twitter and uh, you know when he started Blogger, he didn't want to do comments because he really like, why do I want to have comments on my blog? And then he goes on to create Twitter, which is basically an entire ecosystem designed around comments. people commenting. Yeah. So just a very interesting listening to people like, you know, Zuckerberg talking about how when uh, they went when he and Duskin Moskovitz were coming out to L.A. Like, yeah, let's go check out California. Let's go check out the Bay Area. Let's check it out because they're in the middle of Facebook. They've got hundreds of colleges on board and like yeah we might want to start a company somewhat day out there not facebook the the thing they were going to do after this thing faded they were going to do some other company out there and you know there's an interview with peter Thiel where he and reed hoffman are you know known each other for years good friends very polar opposites you know in politics and stuff but they were the both the first two people that invested in facebook and they talk about how mark zuckerberg went in there and you know you've seen the movie version of what happened which is not what happened and zuckerberg explains facebook in a very few words, staring at the table. And then he's like, well, I've also got a file sharing application called Wirehawk. If you guys want to invest in that, you know, and it's like how he tried to pitch something else instead because he's like, I don't know, Facebook, maybe, I don't know, whatever. And then yeah. it turned out, fun story, Facebook came out to be kind of big. And happily ever after. Yep, no controversy. <laughs> and they never yeah. did anything wrong. The yeah. end. <laughs> well, you know, you get some insight, too, because you're listening to him talk about how when they're building it, they're like, we're building it. But we he just said, we just assumed somebody else was, you know, the real people, the real company was working on a better ber version. You know, they were working on the real thing. And we'll just make this until that comes along. And then you wake up and you're like, oh, we we built it. Yeah. You know, and that that was a very kind of like, you know, he was going to be successful and do something. But. How that came about is just a very interesting, you know, you know, one day you're like, it's like kind of like the story, like Bill Clinton, his first day, you know, as president steps into the Oval Office and it's like, he's like, well, now what? They're like, you're the president. You decide. He's like, what? There was like no secret meetings. There's nothing. It's like, no, it's now you're in charge. And you're like, oh, this is what I asked for. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Nice. All right, gentlemen. It's been weird. Get on the pole. 
get on the pole. Get get on the pole. Get on the pole. Get 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 get. My Tesla has pole position. The the Namco game. Yeah, yeah, plays it on the screen. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. That's cute. I was waiting for Grand Theft Auto Three when when you're not doing all that driving. Yeah. No. Uh, well, all right, we're going to do uh, after things. Anybody need a break? Yeah, I do have to. We got all kids right, home. Second. Everybody's on spring break, so I got to make sure they're not all right. we'll tearing each other up. All right. Break. Hey, Justin. Uh, how you doing, man? Pretty good. I always look forward to this time of the week. Yeah. When uh, the we... boys go take a pee and we get to have a chat. <laughs> Uh, uh. So you uh, you finally dove into into Shit's Creek, huh? Did yeah. Uh, it's um, it's one of those shows. Every once in a while, we'll get into like a show and we'll like watch a few episodes and then it'll just fall off and there'll be something else exciting and we'll we won't go back to it. But yeah. Shit's Creek has kind of survived that like break a few times. We just tend to like if it's like oh what do you want to watch oh Shit's Creek. There's more Shit's Creek. We have like we're only like five episodes into season two so uh there's just going to be a lot of random one episode two episode uh uh samplings but it's uh, good for that too it's it's maybe a little dense with some of the the wholesome stuff but like it's a that's a good show you can kind of take at your own pace well and and also it's like it's you can very much tell that it is written from a performer's point of view Mm -hmm. because like uh in the way that, I mean, to me, if you're going to compare those two, it's very clear that Arrested Development is the brainchild of a writer and Schitt's Creek is the brainchild of a performer. performers. Yeah. Not to say that the writing isn't good. The writing is very funny. But there's a lot of, oops, someone did something and now they have to react to it. And uh, uh, the biggest revelation in the second season is uh, the, the, the daughter, Alexis, uh, as she has to navigate her own personal relationships there's like a few just like laugh out loud great moments uh where she is it, it's just her performance of yeah. like just facial reactions to having to deal with stuff like there's this joke we saw last night where uh she reveals that she never learned how to ride a bicycle right oh yeah and uh and so she's explaining like, oh, well, you know, like there's a lot of things that I do know how to do. And there's a lot of like, uh, uh, it's like, oh, like, well, you, you, you try to get into Kiss Kiss in Tokyo uh, uh, w- without without some skill. And uh, and then he the boyfriend just keeps talking as she just has this like very weird like look on her face. And she's like kind of like smiling and it's like this very like weird discordant kind of reaction and. It's just like the joke is like, oh, I was just remembering this one night of Kiss Kiss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's like that's like a joke where on the page, it's like it might Alexis not play. Makes funny faces, yeah, uh, 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 and then says this thing. Uh, if it's written like that, or if it, or if that's an ad lib, even funnier. Uh, but like there, it's like all right, let let's put this faith in you to kind of sell this joke, and uh, there there's a lot of a lot of that because you have such just killer comedy talent yeah like it is it is a fairly stacked show from top to bottom yeah uh her uh the alexis character is definitely like the one of the more boisterous characters like i i don't i i just uh because i've I've seen i've seen the stuff that's on netflix a couple times now and uh i this is not even from any episode in particular but i just think david yeah (laughs) and it's 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 great it's, i i i that's the only kind of thing i don't like about uh that character is that she's a little too goofy when everyone else kind of gets their own like big emotional moments and it kind of is feels tough for, to break through with that for her character um, yeah but i think that there's uh, uh a it, it's kind of hard because for a show that has gone on i mean five seasons i guess now uh it's hard to keep them fish out of water right for a long time and so it's like and they can... don't like they really kind of settle in yeah in that third up ep- in that third season uh well and, that, and i'm curious to see how it how it evolves uh from there because you you could definitely tell there was like this moment between the first and the second season where it's like all right well uh let's 
tease it and then roll it back because the show's over if they leave the town, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, uh, let's let's give them a reason why we've kind of blown up everything that happened in the first season, and yeah. they do. But you, you, there's only so many times you can hit that button. So I'm 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 definitely excited. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, I'm I'm glad you're checking it out. It's a. Uh... Uh, uh, and so yeah, so it was. It, it is indeed a CBC original that uh, that that then got picked up by uh, by Pop. by Pop. Interesting. But uh, yeah, I, I do remember. I forget where even I saw it. It was on some social media network. But I guess they've done like a few little like tours where they'll like do a reading and you know oh, take Q cool. and A and stuff like that. Yeah. But they are like gigantic in Canada. Like it is a. It is a huge, huge, huge thing. Although I guess they do take a lot of. They are very deliberate in not pointing out, uh, a where they were before. Although it is assumed to be New York, but they're this kind of globe-trotting family, so you never really know. Yeah. And never really know where, Shit's Creek is. Just kind of assume it is somewhere in, you know, if if if, if, if it's not Vermont, it's Canada. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Right. Yeah, go for it. Uh, and to chat room, am I tired? Yes, I always. I I I, I took a you couple. You usually of, roll out of bed right before the show, right? I do, and I, I took a couple <laughs> like ibuprofen last night, and I sleep like soundly. But when I take that, waking up is so hard. Yeah. So. Did they finish the chain song? I mean, they must have. Right? Yes. Yeah, so, oh, thank God. There was the chain <laughs> song, and then like they finished. They had these tall trees. They had to chop down. Yeah. They finished that, and then we're like, oh, the trees are gone. I get to sleep in, and the next day we hear grung, grung, and some guy's out there with the with the stump grinder, <laughs> with, like the size of like a tiny little lawnmower, <laughs> grung, grung, and it was all day for like two or three days. I was like, oh. Jeez, that's awful. I mean, I mean it sucks. It was awful. It's like cancer. Are you, uh, uh, are you seeing all that uh, Patreon activity of uh, one account that is replying to all our comments? I oh, did notice yeah. that. <laughs> and I, I did notice that. Uh, forgive me if I believe it's a disingenuous <laughs> yeah. interest. We may we may kind of take a look at that. I mean, I, uh, can can you can you block uh, fans on Patreon yet? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh absolutely. Okay. All right. But uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, there, there's I I don't want to I don't want to say the name we of the account, yeah. but the avatar is definitely uh, uh, just a woman in bra and panties, uh, just the body shot, yeah. and uh, she uh, it offers such delightful responses as awesome. awesome. Okay, winky face, heart heart emoji, <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, I got that my magic club thing. Same thing. So oh really? Figured out uh, how to spam it. Yeah. yeah. Um, reminds me of a story, and I don't want to name names, but a friend of ours, friend of Justin Mind, we know a guy, uh, entertainer, who is a very sweet guy, who 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 is telling me about how, send me an email about how, like, ah, you know, I this Russian girl online was telling me she's in love with me and all this, and I had to write her and say, listen, you're gonna find somebody else, you know, like, like, you know, I'm flattered and she's gorgeous, and he's like, I was just, like, he's telling me the story, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to tell him that it's. <laughs> You know, because like, you know, listen, she's gorgeous, she's beautiful, she's 22. I'm like, you got to go find somebody else. I'm not for you. It's just, <laughs> it's just like, oh, oh. I mean, oh, he's, so, he is, he is such a sweet man that he politely shooed off the bot. Like, he is, he is, he is the, the proof that you can't con an honest John. Like, he, yeah. he was just like, 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 oh, like, you know, you are going to find love. Like, I'm just, you know, oh. I'm just not at the point of my life where it can be me. Uh, wow. Tally Zarell says TMS got raided by toe suckers today. Is that, is that a, is that a new meme uh, thing that no, I No, they had a moderation issue this morning. Oh, uh, okay. At least that's my understanding of it. <laughs> so. I have this world I don't understand. <laughs> I just don't understand. <laughs> I uh, moved to Amish country. I uh, I forwarded you an email earlier. Oh yeah, or uh, yesterday that I think would be super solid for after things. Hey, uh, yeah. Justin. Yep. Hey, Bryce. Have you enjoyed <laughs> just a week of not 
dealing with <laughs> live show at South by Southwest. <laughs> I mean, we've, I've still had shoots of work and stuff. I mean, look, uh, we we've all had work, but then that was that was work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I've, uh, spent most of the week saying, oh, I stopped doing that too. <laughs> I should probably start doing this other thing like mm -hmm. laundry or any of the million things or taxes or anything that I like need to do that I put on hold as we were in the crunch for, uh, South by there's been a lot of that. That's right. Uh, it's to the chat room. Twist, I wish he knew it was a bot. I, I kept waiting for that punchline. I kept waiting for it to be, and, 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 and then it's like, yeah, so I sent the email, and he sent me, like, a copy of the email. I'm like, oh, no, you don't know, you don't know this dude. He is, he is, very, <laughs> he is he's a very sweet man. <laughs> All righty. You, uh, you guys good to go? Yeah. Yep. Uh. All right, then, Andrew, you can take it away in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, I'm back here. So we got some email. We like it when people send us email. And uh, um, this is a great one um, from a frequent participant here, Mr. Open Bayou. Uh, hi, everyone. After several years of work and technical problems, I finally started to stream on Twitch. I've only been streaming six days and slowly... Uh, Time oh, machine! <laughs> I got the wrong one. We did that one last week. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's the bright so I found that one out. Uh, <laughs> so very good questions, and we want this an update on what's going on there, by the way. This is great. Uh, I'll uh, find uh, you uh, in the uh, chat. I, 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 I can't... I, talk at once. Good. All right. I, I, I can provide an update. Open Bayou uh, has been streaming uh, uh, on his uh, channel and successfully reached affiliate status uh, two days ago. Congratulations! So, well yeah, done. Yeah, he, hit, right. he hit the first uh, the first milestone, and I think we can all agree that the next step is you haven't achieved anything. Keep going. Yes. Keep, take that momentum and continue to move forward and forward and forward. That is what you deserve. Yep, yep, yep. Congrats on that. And then you get to listen to. Then you get to you know gripe with these guys about oh, i did a week of live stream and it's south by south and oh, i'm so <laughs> tired and uh, <laughs> all these people want to hear me talk live and, and that happened yeah that was it was between the shows yeah yeah i know so and also do, do we have an updated email <laughs> yeah uh, i didn't make it awkward enough <laughs> i can try uh, but in all seriousness, that is great, and that is just, it's the day in, day out kind of thing of keeping at it. Keep going. Um, yep, 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 yep. And it's it's one day you go, oh, I have to do this thing, but I'm glad I get to do the thing. Yeah. So. Yes. Um, we have, this is from, <laughs> part of the problem I have with these emails is everybody uses these nicknames and stuff. And so, <laughs> HTPS443. <laughs> great. Hi, guys. I was listening to a recent episode of Bizarre Briefing, and they were talking about how the video editors get feedback from Brian. I'm wondering, what's the process for you as a last-step video reviewer? Are you checking a checklist or just a general feeling? Any other thoughts on how creators should, could do last-step reviews of their content going out to the world? Uh, man, uh, it feels like there are two sides to this. Uh, one, one is like what we did. I feel like there's a past tense story and a present tense story. Um, and then the other question of like, if you're the creator and you're also the editor, I don't know what the last step would look like. But I know that in the very, very early days, um, we would get a rough cut of a Scam School episode. This is what, 11 years ago. And I would just go through and, and indicate time codes where something felt like as a viewer. And, and this is one of the advantages is, uh, you know, you, you're able to look at it with a fresh pair of eyes and you're able to say, oh, my God, this feels like it lingers too long. Or, you know, or it's like I don't see the point of this, this, you know, 407 to 412. Uh, it seems like all of that could get cut and we could get to the point faster or whatever. Uh, it's it's a very length or was a very lengthy, lengthy process. Nowadays, uh, we're on the other side of it where. Brant and Bryce uh, and John are all better arbiters of quality than I am. And so I increasingly have uh, very few comments because 
you know, and if I and when I do have a comment, uh, almost always it's an a, an artistic or engineering decision, right? Would that would that be a good way to put it? Yeah. Like there's a reason. Sure. Like like yes, that is kind of awkward. Yeah. Here's what we had like, and why uh, we ended up there. Like specifically, what was this? Two weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago for a scam nation thing. We yeah. There was there was a bit early on that that I wanted to keep in as a as a matter of cleanliness right and and we kind of had a back and forth about well do we do we really need it you know and and you know at that point that's more of a conceptual issue not like a technical execution thing right right it becomes like i have a reason for this you have a reason for this and and uh, uh, it's not like this is a bad video either, if it's not done one it, way it really becomes a weird like uh, listening contest. You're like, well, now I'll listen to what you say, sir. <laughs> well, let me internalize what you just brought up. And uh, but 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 that's you know we're we're sort of on the other side of what five years of, of building up that yeah. that that back and forth. Uh, I I do remember in the early days. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I wish I had a simple answer for you. Um, you know, for from the technical side, because I do a lot of the podcasts and stuff that we do here. Um, over time, I've built up maybe not a rigid checklist, but I try to have a process that I go through to make sure uh, when there have been issues that uh, uh, it hits these different things so that I know that they go right. Like one, one issue that we had on Cord Killers, uh, I mean, a while ago, was sometimes it would render out and it would render silence instead of a clip, usually because of an editing or rendering or some sort of conforming error. And so now when I'm done rendering, I run it through another audio program so I can see that the whole show is in there. Mm -hmm. And then I know, okay, well, I've got the product and so it's good to go. A lot of that process stuff comes out of just doing it and doing it wrong and realizing what mistakes happen and happen frequently and what ways you can quickly check on that stuff. Um, uh, at least from a technical perspective. And then, yeah, if you if you send it to someone and if you have a friend who's like, hey, can you just take a look at this? What do you think about this? Like, that's a really good way to get an extra perspective on, on, on your work. And and it uh, I can only speak from my perspective. In the early days of scam school, it came, my notes came from, and this is going to sound like I'm unfairly beating myself up, but but I think there's a tactical advantage to to just a smidge of self-loathing like like when when you very first get started you're just excited to see your mug on the screen and you can't believe that's your face on the screen yeah. uh and you keep stuff that probably doesn't belong there if you can get a little bit farther uh, and it especially helps if somebody else does the a roll uh, of the edit uh and and like actively hate your dumb stupid face and then and then the moment it starts and you see too much of yourself you're like get get I don't see the point of that. I don't see the point of that. Enter the headspace of the disinterested third party that is eventually going to consume the content. Uh, in the case of Scam School, it was the star of the show is the trick. So every time there would be a block of text, whereas too much Brian talking about Brian stuff, I'd be all like, hey, man, can we can we just take this last sentence where I finally got to the point yeah. and get rid of everything else beforehand? Uh, I think in general... Uh, ego deflation when it comes to the editing phase is extremely important. That was that was the hard lesson I had to go through too. Like when I made my magic videos and and had to edit my own stupid face. And <laughs> and you first you're like I hate the sound of my voice. Hey, we all hate the sound of our own voice because it's not how it sounds to us. And right. then it's seeing yourself. And then it's trying to get to the core of that. Checklists are great. But also make sure that the checklist doesn't always end in, uh, and I guess I shouldn't release. You know, you've got to find that balance. And I like a checklist because if I check off everything I'm supposed to do, then I ship, then I release it. You're out of you excuses. Know? Yeah, no, that's a good yeah. point. Like if you've checked all the boxes, even if you feel like, well, it just could have been better, you're like, you're right. And it will be when you try it again mm -hmm. sometime in the future. Yeah. If you're left with, you know, your final product and you're checking it and you're like, well, it doesn't feel right, but I don't know what's wrong with it then you're probably good to put it out because mm -hmm. once you put it out, it is a different thing. Then you're like, I am now seeing the thing that everyone is seeing. And now I know how I'm reacting and, and anybody else, if they're reacting now, I know what I feel like when this is finally the decision and the, the pen to paper. Um, Cause Have, you'll keep making more stuff and you'll, you'll get better next time. Having, having other pairs of eyes who you trust. And that's the key thing is that the trust part, and we can talk a bit about that is, who should you trust or not? But I write books. I've got an agent that reads them, makes some notes. I've got a publisher who she takes a look at them. And I got a developmental ed editor, uh, Ed Ed Stackler, who's worked on the last now four 
Theo Cray books. And Ed's great. Ed, Ed can tell me anything. Ed can point out when I forgot to follow a thread or I didn't explain something, whatever. And it's hard initially when I had to go through my first edits with another editor on books, you know, you get back this document with thousands of notes. It's painful. But then after a time, you know, you work with an editor long enough, they know you and you get to it and you're like, yep, I screwed up there. Thanks for pointing it out. You fix this. Your solution's great. And like I prove his edits like are easy to approve because Ed gets me, gets what I'm doing and it works out really well. Yeah. So and, helpful, and even, helpful process. Even before you got into your publishing deals, you would send out beta versions of your books, right, Andrew? Mm hmm. You know, so what I did when before I had the opportunity to work with, you know, somebody who was, you know, brought on full time or to work on my book for, you know, in a professional capacity, mm -hmm. you know, Justin would take a look at it and give me notes about content and structure, you know, and then for editing, you know, I put the books up on a Google doc and I'd share it with everybody here. You know, everybody who was listening to our podcast, just say, email me and I give people a link and I'd get, do crowd edits on stuff. And it was a way to get that done. Um, it's hard because I know a lot of creators who create something and they go to their their best friend or this person they know, but it's literally, you might as well just be asking some rando on the street for the quality of advice. Or sometimes they have a friend who's creative, but a frustrated creative. And that can be the worst because yeah. then they're like, well, you should do this and this, and maybe we should co-write and da da da. And then you end up with just garbage. Well, yeah. I think that's, that's the key is you need somebody that is, that can understand the form of what you want to do. And that's the thing what Brian was getting at with the videos and what Andrew has always been uh, good at with the manuscripts is this isn't at a certain point, this isn't about the idea, right? This is about the uh, uh, getting this product out. Uh, and if it's at the point where you are looking at last notes, right? Or you're looking at here are things that we want to shave down and shape before you push it out the door then they're fundamentally different than what somebody who's going to be like, oh, you're doing a detective story? Like, well, I think that the, 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 the villain should be the dog. Like, and it's like, okay, well, there's no, that's not about what this is. That's about something else. And so, you know, when, when I was first working with Andrew, I, I would try to be very mindful that like the notes that I, that I gave him were either specific like, okay, I'm confused here. Is there a way that we can clarify just where you're going with that? Or like uh, uh, oftentimes there would be like, like, oh, I think you have a great opportunity to do to highlight this one thing, having now seen all of it. But it has to be about clarifying, perfecting or getting uh, uh, or, or amplifying stuff that's already there. And, and that's that's such a big key, uh, not only in terms of what you're looking for, but also if you're giving those notes, like you have to kind of remove yourself. You have to you have to respect the art as its own thing. And then, you know, not to be all hippy dippy about it, but like figure out like what it needs, what it wants, how you are going to make it the best it can be. That's a big point is trying to figure out, you know, what when you're working on somebody else, like when, you know, Bryce is working on a Brian product. He knows what a Brian product is and understanding that Brian algorithm. And that's part of collaboration of after a period of time, we're like, mm -hmm. oh, this is the choice they would make, which is different than the choice I would make, not because it's better or worse, because it's stylistic. And so yeah. I think that's that's part of that learning curve of of working with somebody else. It, yeah. If you're used to like client work or it, it, you can think of it in the same way, right? You are your client or you have a, uh, a hypothetical audience member who is your client right like mm -hmm. you you we, we we talked about uh what was the name of the book start with why oh yeah a, few, a while ago like you know you have to have purpose and intentionality and that can um uh inform your decision your decision making right if you're if you're just being like i i don't know i'm making this thing you know if you're not even trying to copy someone or look at someone and say well i don't want it to be like this you know then you're going to be stuck especially at the end where you didn't know what if you didn't have something to start off that you were aiming at. You're not going to have anything to compare it to at the end. You're just going to have this mat this mass without 
necessarily a compass. Well, and, and that does sort of hint at something I've said before, where it's, it's easy to figure out what doesn't belong than what does, mm -hmm. right? And if you, uh, again, one of the messages of start with why is you have a clear definition and then everything that is not that, like uh, it's very clear what is and is not an Apple thing, right? Uh, Apple, Apple has a very core idea about we want to empower people to change the world and, and uh, be different or whatever all their crap is. But the the point is, uh, it's you can tell when something is very unAppleish because they've so clearly defined their why, and you could do the same thing for your edits as well. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Um, let's change uh, speed here a little bit. We talked about a little bit before earlier. We started the podcast about Twitter is changing, uh, has a new app out that changes the way you can interact with it because they want to make it more social. Uh, less, I guess, maybe influencer based or whatever. And, you know, we're, we're over what, 10 years into 10 years plus into Twitter, Facebook has been around and we're all starting to evolve in how we use these platforms. And I think that we've had conversations here before where people are like, like, Facebook has been tracking me for ads. And it's like, yeah, yeah, no, that's their algorithm has been intentionally sending things to them. Like, yes, no, yeah, they've been doing that for a decade. And now now the, the public consciousness is there. We as creators have to figure out like how much you know, we're we're dealing with enterprises. Their entire job is to get us to watch it as much as possible because that's how they make revenue. Our eyeballs on these things, you know, watching Twitter, watching Facebook, interacting with this. You know, and, and I think you reach a point where you're like, oh, yeah, they're sending me this conversation because they know I'm going to get a little irritated. And I'm going to go have to go tell them something. And and I find myself to this day, like I'll be on like Hacker News and somebody will say something like, that's not right. And I'll start writing a comment and I have to say, stop. <laughs> what will happen? I'll write this comment. I'm going to point out why they're wrong and then I'll be done. Well, no, I'm going to get a little notification. They responded. And I'm like, no, you're wrong, and let me go do this, and then I'm going to be waiting. I'm going to have anxiety over, like, did anybody read it? Did anybody anybody comment on it? And then the next thing I know, I've wasted half a day on something stupid. And Ooh, so uh, how have your habits have changed? How have your habits have, have changed as far as social media, et cetera? Uh, Justin, have you done anything drastic you would like to share with the class? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's your, Bryce goes, oh my God, as Justin leans into the microphone, grabbing it tightly, ready to go. And I wasn't sure you're ready to talk about this, sir. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know how they, uh, they have mobile apps, <laughs> you know, and you have a very popular mobile app is Twitter. Well, I don't because I deleted Twitter from my phone. <laughs> okay, but, but so done. you're done with Twitter. You quit Twitter, did, did you? No. Oh, I only deleted it from my phone. Oh, but but your phone's the only way you interact with the internet. So so really, nope. a lot has changed. I interact with Twitter on the desktop. Oh, oh, so so what's different? I spend a lot more time on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, please, please. Uh, in all in all seriousness, this is like a running joke with Bryce that I like to annoy. Bryce, I don't but... even know why I'm the target of this joke. I'm because fine. Always, with... It's because you always have this reaction. You always have this like like deflated, like oh god, oh my god. Because it is an annoying thing to say, and I like saying it. But it's the, the new I don't watch TV. Exactly. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's the new I don't have a TV in my house. Um. So I deleted Twitter off my phone uh, because I was not writing this other podcast that I've been uh, that I will not talk about because that makes me not write it. Um, and I had not written it fast enough. I had not been hitting my milestones. I wanted to take away something that I knew I wasted time with, because if the point is that I need to power through all the things I need to do in a day so I can take the time that I've allotted for myself at the end of the day to work on this, then I need to honor that and I needed to uh, adjust my behavior uh, uh, and part of it is I have a very addictive phone relationship I am constantly on my phone and Twitter was uh, uh, and, and still is uh, a tremendous opportunity to just hit that button that gets me feedback and I could always justify it as 
oh, well, you know, I, I'm a pop culture commentator between politics and, and other stuff. Like, I literally have daily content that I need to fill, and knowing what people are talking about on Twitter is part of that. Yeah, the, uh, the, the version of the lie I used to tell myself is like, oh, no, this is important brand management. I'm managing yeah. my brand with engagement. And I do think that there's a reason why I haven't, like, deleted my Twitter account. Uh, uh, because I do think that it is a, a valuable place where every once in a while I have an idea for something and I put it out there and I like to see the reaction, but I think it has been healthy for it to be more of a destination and less of a thing that I have with me at all times. And also I, I cannot say this for everybody, but I can certainly say it for me, man does it has been good for my psyche that I am not around some of the trauma of Twitter. <laughs> Twitter can very often be a very traumatic place uh, where people are explaining the ills of the world and not to say that the ills of the world are not something that we should pay attention to, but I feel like I can get that in a way that is not quite as performative as uh, uh, Twitter and and when I stop in, I see where the river is, you know, uh, uh, at the point that I click onto the website and then I click away. Whereas when I had it on my phone, oh, my God, I it was it was just it, anytime that I needed my phone, I would check Twitter. Anytime that I was done checking Twitter, I would check Twitter just to make sure that something else hadn't happened. And even now I I have this phantom limb of like oh, I'm bored and I'll just find myself like opening the phone and like going to my social folder and being like, "Oh, that's that's where I would sink an hour and a half every day without question." Uh this is nowhere near as dramatic as deleting the Twitter app from your phone, but uh in in a similar way, um I, I recently, you know, I, I have TweetDeck on the desktop and I'll go through, I try to answer everybody who replies me and so on. But then I would reach the end and then normally that's when you start hitting refresh. But then it's like, no, I'm at the end and I would close the tab and it's yeah. like, we are done until further notice. <clears throat> that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm in the inverse in that like, I don't have to, like my, my desktop is where I do most of my work. So my computer here, there is not the only communications thing that I have in my home row is Skype because, you know, talking to you chuckleheads, you know, um, and that's literally once a week I open up Skype and then Skype is off. You know, I only do that. Everything else is like it's Scrivener. It's a creation tool. I don't do Twitter. I don't have any. And I've talked about this. I have no notifications on this computer because when I sit down to write a book, I don't have time. I don't want to be distracted because God knows I'll invent enough. All my notifications are off my phone. Like, yeah, I'll go to t phone is my way of like responding to people on Twitter at replies and stuff. But I open it up. I go say a few things. Then I go away. And, and when I go back in, I see anybody talk to me. I say hello. No Facebook. I don't have Facebook installed anywhere. Oh, yeah. Wow. Facebook I took off my phone and then realized that there were a few annoying uh, social networks that I had authorized through there and so I've uh, I reinstalled it buried it in the back of the back of the back and turned off all notifications literally just because I want it there so when I hit authorize through Facebook it doesn't uh, uh, say like all right well text this troll and then uh, answer his four riddles and uh, then I misspell something so it's just easier to have it there but in general like I have I've gotten off Facebook primarily like I, I, it, it, it's still there so when i'm doing when i'm doing the big push like for south by and stuff like that like i definitely want to have it out there but right now my facebook feed is entirely just re cross uh, platform instagram posts i feel yeah. i feel guilty for not taking advantage of the opportunity to reach people but but i feel like they're just going to figure out some way to charge me but like even if even if once I'm able to get a message through, that that'll be the last time, and the next time they'll figure out it's an effective message, they'll they'll explain they'll send me an invoice. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I will. Facebook is great as a marketing tool, 
you know, because it's so effective. And that's why I don't, you know, partake in it. And, and, and it's, you know, as funny as that, I, I think, you know, we're still having a dumb conversation started three years ago about people blaming it for all sorts of stuff that it's not really the problem. It's a thing that's deeper as far as how people understand how they get stuff. But it's just, you know, you're, you are, you are the con, you are the product with these things. You are the product and you know you have to figure out what your time is worth you know we're all people building businesses we're all people doing you know trying to create and it's either you know uh i had the conversation with my girlfriend she was at an event you know and she's like i don't know if i want to be the person that goes to these events or the person and i'm paraphrasing your words here she's crossed the room but like you want to be the person making the stuff for that you know yeah. you know and uh, and that's what the show is because we're all kind of like this um I don't use Instagram as much anymore because once they win algorithm, it's hard to get to the end. You know, and again, it's another, you know, Facebook. Well, like, and, and, oh, you're turning off Facebook. Oh, you're going to Instagram, are you? Oh, that other place, right? Let's see, which is, you know, Facebook. But, um, yeah. but at least, I mean, here's the one thing I will say for Instagram because it has now replaced Twitter as my de facto, I'm bored, I'm going to check it. Instagram has less stuff going on per day, certainly less stuff going on per hour. When I check it in the morning, I get to the end of pretty much everything that's built up over a day. And then past that, like, I I greatly appreciate the fact that Instagram has the friendly bartender at the bottom of the feed that says, you're up to date. It's like, it's just the friendly bartender saying, you want to know what? You can go home. You know, <laughs> You've had fine. it up, my friend. Up. Uh, I bet you're oh. feeling pretty good. Why don't you just uh, take her on easy and get some work done? And and I look at the thing and I'm like, OK, that's cool. I, I appreciate that. I like that. Uh, and I'm and I'm gone. And I and I wind up spending I wind up enjoying my time there. And also, oh, my God, it's just it's not uh, uh, like at this point. Also, Instagram is also 50 percent me following all the candidates feeds. Oh, geez. So well, there's just to, to be honest, that, that's the big, what that is. That is the biggest thing keeping me from getting engaged in Instagram is is just how out of date all my follows are like all the people I'm on who I'm who are I'm following are like from I don't know six years ago that I met once and I'm like I don't want to see all these pictures of your dogs and babies and whatever that's the hard thing that's the 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 hey if we should follow you know a group a group of people like five people at your restaurant oh we should all follow each other and you're like I don't I don't know, like, I, I'm going to do this because I feel the pressure, but now I'm sort of stuck. <laughs> you know, and so. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, I I, I realized that. Well, because my Facebook was just always a total poop show, like, because uh, I've always accepted everybody that has friended me, and I've, I've uh, uh, always looked at it as kind of a marketing tool. But at the point where I was like, oh, wait, that baby is definitely – the child of a friend of mine's ex-girlfriend from like seven years ago. I don't care a lick about whether or not like what happens in their lives. There's literally like no connection beyond the fact that at some point you were in my social circle at a time when it made sense to follow you on Facebook because we were all commenting on the same stuff. Man, I'm waiting for Peach 2 to come out so I can start with a clean slate. Peach, Peach is still up. up. <laughs> Peach is still up. You can still get Yeah, on but Peach. I'm following all the wrong people on Twitch. I, 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 on Twitch. Peach. On, on oh, Peach. Oh, that's a new thing. <laughs> Twitch. Twitch. By the way, hey, I had an idea for a social network. Here's okay, all right, ready, ready, ready. A social network that literally only exists for South by Southwest Interactive Weekend. Oh, it evaporates. It, in it, it, it goes live like... 48 hours before, mm -hmm. right? And then it and then it goes down 48 hours afterward and it shows up once a year. That's great. Or or actually That's a fun now, idea. you could you could uh do that on an ongoing basis where it's a uh it's a social network that makes social networks that are like burners basically. Uh, yeah. uh B R N R Z it will be the name of the social network. <laughs> what about what if we just make all of the messages ephemeral? Uh, well, no. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. What's going on? Oh, I, I think Andrew was muted. I I was saying. Okay. Uh, somebody sneezed across the room. Oh, oh gotcha. <laughs> um, uh, no. 
But, 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 but to make the entire network ephemeral, so there's no, so it's only in the moment. And, mm -hmm. and you can go back and see, you have to wait until it's like summer camp. Like we, everybody like, and, and maybe this is just really, Brian, this is just trying to recreate the magical Peach Weekend. Yeah. Peach Weekend was such a magical moment wherein uh, uh, there was, we just knew that this thing would never last, but it was so fun to be kings of Peach and uh, 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 put all, like use all the dumb bells and whistles uh, and then understand that it was just going to die. Like it would be, it would be over. But this way it's like, Literally, we just launch it. It goes. It, it's there for that hot moment where everybody wants to use it, and then it goes away. There's no like, uh, how much time? Well, do I want to spend? And then no. you can even have Here, a countdown built in where it's like that's the point. Everybody's like, guys, let's stay in touch. Let's all, hey man, follow me on these other things. I swear yeah. we're gonna we're gonna keep in touch. And then he's just summer <sighs> camp. It's digital summer camp. That'd so be you can, great. The, yeah, you could put in like and make it harder for people to track you so you don't have to be followed afterwards. And I think we can get some Middle Eastern funding for this. <laughs> I think, yeah, no, look, come on. Who's got a, who's got MBS's uh, email? We can get some Saudi wealth fund uh, <laughs> cash. Yeah. This. I'm thinking some other organizations out there that could use like a spontaneous pop up social network that then. Uh, you know, uh, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a cell of a kind, you know, kind of a cell. Kind. That's that'll be it. Just uh, there, yeah. It'll just be only people uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, uh, what what the code is for floppy disk repair and uh, what the coordinates of where the cache of weapons are in Kabul. Um, there is a, you know, uh, was it the Brian? Were you the one that talked about? Was it like the tower in the square? Or, um... Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, I, I believe it's the square and the tower, but it talks about the difference between um, ivory tower thinking versus uh, bottom up, top down versus bottom up is what that whole book was about. You know, and and, and a thought that kind of comes from out of that is power is networks. Uh, your your power is your network. You know, you want power. If, you know, you're a politician. You're running for office. The number of people you can pick up on your phone the first day and get support and get money for is a big factor, and you can. It, there's how popular, I mean, there's how likable you are, there's your policies, but the power of that network. Do you have these nonprofits you work with that are going to support you, you know, is, you know, on Shell Edelston on one side or Tom Steyer on the other, you know, in your Rolodex, whatever. And networks also on another level is just, it, and it, you go, you go, of course, but, but it's like really like, yeah, networks are super important and the purpose they serve is, you know, I mean, hard to just even, you know, I don't know. I just a thing I think a lot about, you know, if like people I know who are very effective have very good networks. Yeah. You know, I talk to two people, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're only one step away from many more people, though. It's, it's, you know, put it that way, you know. Um, oh, come on. That help? That, it's easily four. Yeah, easily four. Easily four people. Uh, no, I like your idea of the pop-up sort of social network kind of thing because there are times where you do events and stuff where it's like, yeah, I just want to be able to talk to people now and be able to organize. And then when we're done, you know, not have to, you know, have the carryover. Because uh, I think it's like, all right, so why haven't we seen another social network pop up since Snapchat? Like, like Snapchat was like the last big paradigm shifting social network that launched as a social network. And I even mean, then, I, it I, was would say, I would say largely... I would say largely inertia, right? Where it's like um, you start with, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, all the predecessors to Facebook, but Facebook comes in and becomes the dominant way that you can, you know, write long posts or short posts or and share X, Y, and Z about yourself. And in which case, now you have the second mover uh, advantage of being the opposite of whatever the first thing is. So in that case, we're going to keep it very minimalist. minimalist. It's going to be Twitter and that'll be it. And then now, third mover, it becomes increasingly hard to figure out, like, okay, what can we do that the other two don't do? And it's like, let's make it ephemeral. So now we have Snap. After that, you get to, you get diminishing returns, right? So now, oh, like, I, like oh, yeah, was, sorry, uh, I, I was going to say, like, um, you know, th then you get into, uh, as B Fiper's pointing out, like, uh, musically, that's now TikTok, and then, uh, or Peach with its uh, animated GIFs that eventually showed up uh, elsewhere. Like, it, those become increasingly... Uh, tiny, tiny benefits. When and and uh, also we we tend to blur social media, social networks, and then just social communications tools because like 
Facebook came out, was great, solved a lot of problems that other other app platforms sort of tried to solve, then made it a lot easier to organize. First organized at the college level. So it was everybody you knew who you spoke to, you got every, how that network spread is fascinating because if Facebook didn't launch on college campuses, we never would have heard, on it, heard of it, but it was a great tool there. Then you get the iPhone comes out and then changes mobile phones. And you have, at that point, you get like Instagram comes out, which slowly becomes more of a social network. And that's like Snapchat, which is a post Facebook social network. And, and there are people like Peter Thiel at the time, like the next big thing won't be another social network. Well, Snapchat came along and guess what? There was a big thing that's, you know, yeah. you know, a social network because it was like, Snapchat was like, I want to talk to four friends or I want to have five friends. We want to make videos and the ephemeral nature as Brian points out is part of it. But it was also, it's like, I look at Snapchat more like, it's more like kind of a, 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 a slightly more group focused iChat or iMessage, yeah. you know? And it wasn't, you know, it was, I, I didn't wrap my head around it because I'm like, well, how do I reach a lot of people? How do I use it to broadcast? And it's like, it's not meant for that. Yeah, but then why would I want to use it? You know, I'm old guy looking at this as a broadcast tool and it's not. Yeah. Everything fills a very, very specific need. But I do know that, man, and it might be nostalgia and it might just be like uh, 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 we, we, we don't have that crazy rush uh, uh, like like we did at, at South By's gone past of like, oh, this is the big dumb thing. And whether or not the big dumb thing lasts throughout the weekend, we don't care. We just know that right now everybody's on the big new dumb thing. And, and be it Foursquare or Gowalla or, or whatever for, for a hot run there. Uh, post Twitter uh, blowing up at South by and, and uh, Facebook continuing to be on the rise there. Uh, there was just like one per year. And I was just like, I'm like, I just don't want to see that go. On. I want to know. I want that whatever. And just load it with all the dumb features, every stupid thing you could think of, throw it all against the wall and then shut it down. Well, you, you need to have part. What you want to have is a cool, as a, a concept where you go, Twitter was cool because in the post after you know blogging platforms came like great I can share my thoughts like I only got a I only got two sentences and Twitter's like Twitter was great you know first is this kind of SMSy sort of thing but then as this platform of sharing these things solved a problem you looked at this go great so much of the content I want to share with people fits into 144 characters wonderful Instagram was like wonderful photos because. I, I want to, you know, there, it's interesting listening to the people who on the, the Masters Scale podcast, you know, the people behind Flickr were like, hey, you know, we Flickr was brilliant because Flickr was like, hey, all these other companies are starting to make it easier for you to take your pictures you shoot on your electronic camera and print them where Flickr's yeah. like, maybe you just want to look at them on the Internet. Maybe the Internet is the final product. And Flickr came about, <clears throat> but it was four years, five years before the iPhone, and then the iPhone comes out, and now it's like, yeah, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna take the photo on my phone, and it's never gonna leave my phone, but other people will see it on their phones, and you know, the whole idea of mobile, but I guess what I'm saying is you need, I, I, li I like the big dumb idea, I, I still have like Vine, like the app for that on my phone, I never used, but you, yeah. By and, the way, and, that was, and that was where like TikTok right now mm -hmm. is the evolved Vine. Like mm -hmm. it, it took the, some of the functionality of Musical.ly and, and then rebranded because they wanted to be more of a mini uh, a mini uh, video platform wherein uh, they evolved that product in the same way that I think Instagram stories evolved the Snapchat product of saying like, okay, but what do people want to do easier? How do people want to dress this up? And where Twitter saw a, a, a time and money sink in Vine uh, musically was like, oh no, they're that, that half of the people that are gigantic on YouTube now started out as Vine stars. It, 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 there is still a, a tremendous uh, desire for for a certain demographic to have little mini videos. And I think we'll probably look back at Discord as a very quietly yeah. growing social network only because it is it is intentionally blocked off on you know servers instead of just. A big Facebook feed. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I. I think. Will. I think it kind of snuck in, but I think it's definitely in there. It's just not. It's not a network the way we expect social, quote unquote, social oh. network to be right now. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Discord and Slack to me are are two tremendous success stories that understood, uh, you know, a, a very specific niche need that uh, uh, have have delivered on it in two very specific different ways. Like, there's no way that Slack was ever going to be Discord. There's no way the Discord was ever going to be Slack. Uh, they are they, although they are in many ways similar functionality wise. Uh, one is work and one is play and uh, uh, be that for video games as discord is primarily used or for just communities. Uh, it is very, very intuitive for, for that. Now the, the curious thing is if discord ever wants to get into ways that you can uh, uh, beyond your own selection of, Oh, I want to join this server and this server and this server. If there's any way that we can do like, Oh, do we want to have a, some color war functionality between the the jury discord and the diamond club discord although i'm sure that everybody's on both but like uh or everybody that's on mine is on diamond club as well but something like that where you can fun find interesting ways that you can like create a portal between the two ones beyond just what you select yeah you know the the funny thing too is that like chat or excuse me uh slack came from uh glitch which was this video company had the video game or it's an interactive game glitch which had users but then you know they realized they weren't going to grow and they're like we gotta we gotta reinvent ourselves and so they yeah. fired everybody off and then they're like they had an in-house what do we have I'm like well we have this really cool tool in-house for developing that allowed people to catch up and that was slack and slack came from a video game company and obviously discord came from that and that's both people looking at real problems and saying all right, telling people to use IRC is not really a practical solution. Okay. And and a lot of people would go like, well, no, we have IRC. We have these things. It's like, yeah, but you've got these. There's so much friction there. If you yeah. eliminate it's that like, friction. If, if, if the solution is IRC, congratulations. You know Latin. Like all, <laughs> everything that's going to be built on it will be built from Latin. You should be uh, uh, – congratulations. You are a scholar and a, a, a gentleman – for understanding it, but we're moving on to Italian. We're moving on to Spanish. We're moving on to English. Like yeah. these are the things that little differences that build civilizations. Yeah. You know, people yeah. want permanence. They want to be able to share, you know, share media. They want to be able to catch up, you know, IRC, you can't catch up on anything if you're not logged in all the time. Moderation mm -hmm. tools. Moderation. Yeah. You know, um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, yeah. It's, it's an evolution on that. And so, you know, that's yep. certainly why I spend a lot of time on Discord. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, as far as you're not going to displace the thing if all you're offering is ours, you know, we, in Magic we joke like, ah, I invented a new trick. Oh, it's this only oh, that's so and so's card trick. Yeah, but my my cards are blue. That's right. <laughs> um, Google Plus, you know, finally fully sort of shutting down. And man, you go back and read Wired Magazine when they launched Google Plus. This is, this is, they'd made it like this is the, do or die. If we can't make Google Plus work, we're dead. We're dead. You know, and man, they pushed hard. And I remember when Brian was a king of Google Plus. I I was. I was. Also, uh, there's still a lot that I liked about Google Plus, but unfortunately, you can't you can't force anybody to relocate over there. And that, and ultimately, I, a social network is built on the strength of the folks who are there. Yeah, I, I mean, it had sure. it had some cool features, but it was just this wasn't enough. Yep. I, I, I remember this. I have one specific memory. I'm pretty sure we were in California. Andrew and I were in California because he was doing lecture uh, stops. And uh, Google Plus launched. And we were at a, we we're in the car at a stopped, like a train was going by. And we just had no idea how long this train, but it was like the longest train that had ever passed by. And we, we watched the video on one of our phones announcing google plus and i remember even in that car we were like well hangout seems cool <laughs> and yeah. it's like, like sure enough that's that is the legacy the legacy of of uh, of, of google plus beyond youtube comments which i think it, it, it you can yeah, arguably that, say that's the is, that's the quiet thing like uh secretly i mean as if for nothing else as a backdoor to totally fix google comment or uh, youtube comments uh that alone made uh, in my book google plus a noble experiment yeah. 
Yeah, and I still have two stupid YouTube accounts because they had you, they forced you to like create a second one or whatever. Man, don't even get on me about that. I got like 17. It's ridiculous. I know. But I was like, oh, and our growth rate's great. Like, yeah, you didn't give me a choice. Hmm. <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, they had cool ideas. They have, and that's the thing. A lot of these, like, like, oh, there's a cool thing, but it's not enough. I just sent Bryce the, uh, the link to Did Google Shut? down uh and it's basically like all of the different things that google's acquired or had or whatever and have they shut it down or what's oh, from my cold dead hands you'll take inbox you dirty sons of oh wait <laughs> are, you, are you so you are in love with inbox i they've not they've, they've stopped acting like they have to move me over to it oh yeah. no end of the month and end of the month end of the month they're shutting down inbox no yeah. no march. end of march weird because uh, because I remember Google that. shut down doesn't doesn't seem to think so. <laughs> That's right. It's a, Seems I mean, to think it's healthy. It, it's been it's been giving me the giving me the the alerts uh, on on move to Gmail. Gmail's cool. <laughs> Even though we moved you from Gmail. Just oh, you kidding. know, I did end up moving over to Gmail, so that must be why I never saw any of that stuff. But yeah, March, wild. Yeah. They have it as healthy here, but I wonder did Google shut down yet? If that shut down, <laughs> <laughs> maybe they maybe they're not keeping up. That's funny. Uh, yeah, it's it's you know it's a hard thing too. Is when a company gets acquired by a bigger company, I see this time in time again. Is sometimes often you're like they're done, not because oh this company's horrible, but you know one of the things I heard on one of these podcasts they talked about the problem is. They talk, they talk like the, the guy with Dropbox and how people kept saying that, like, oh, dude, you're, you're going to be doomed when Google comes out with, you know, it was Platypus. Right. Platypus was going to be, you know, their, the competitor for Dropbox was going to kill Dropbox, right? And he's like, I'm not worried. And they're like, oh, you're dumb not to be worried. And he's like, it's not a priority. They're not putting their best engineers on it. You know, they're, they're not, they don't have the, their A engineers on this project. And you, you heard that, like, at the time Larry Page was, you know, thinking about, you know, he wanted to get the get rid of the whole concept of a document, you know, which is kind of like I don't know, like Apple and Final Cut Ten. Oh, geez. you know, like you know, we're gonna change the way you do it. I'm like, I don't think you're qualified, yeah, to make that decision about my life. And then Google Drive came out. And eventually, it's good. It's good for, but like the best thing about Google Docs is pretty much what was great about Rightly, which was what the Google doc was before they bought rightly, you know, it was this quick way to write a document and they've added some other stuff, but I don't think they've become, you know, cool. Meanwhile, Dropbox, I use that all the time. Oh yeah. I mean, well, Dropbox is ubiquitous. And, and even then I think it could probably use a little bit of polishing because it's great. Same product as it's been for the last five years. But, uh, uh, in general, yeah, I remember a uh, buddy of mine started a, a, a file hosting service. And the big thing was, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, the big thing was like, oh, G Drive's gonna eat you. G Drive's gonna be there, and and then you start reading all these uh, 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 rumors about like, well, you know, Chrome isn't really a browser. Think of Chrome more like an operating system, and no one in the in the future is gonna really own everything. Everything's gonna be downloaded uh, 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 when you need it, and you'll never really need to host anything. So why would we put a bunch of time, effort, and money into uh, creating a place. People are like crudely uploading files. Burp, 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 uh, Amish much? Uh, uh, we're in this whole new zone. And then it turns out Chrome was just a browser. Yeah. The future. Let's stop it now, guys, while we have a chance. Yeah. Well, you want to know what? Uh, uh, they took some big, big hacks that Google... They're always always up to something, these guys. Mm -hmm. But seriously, for real, from my cold dead hands, I like my shiny <laughs> sun. <laughs> You're gonna be beating on the door of inbox for the next month. I just like they, they, keep, they keep coming to me. They're like, "Hey, uh, uh, Gmail's pretty cool. Do you want to try Gmail?" I'm like, "You're gonna <laughs> kick me out. You're gonna you're I hack me from this." I I switched to the Apple Mail app on my desktop after they did the last reboot of gmail and yeah. you know and I, I i had that that one of the problems too is the way the threading works and they're like i missed conversations because you know but i just i didn't like that i'm like i'm nope sorry you pushed it too far you know, you know i'm not gonna give you any more i never gave you any money so never mind okay no more of my information yeah uh picks 
Uh, I got a pick. It's a... Uh, mm, actually, I don't know. Let's just talk about it. It's not really a pick. Yeah, maybe it's a pick. <laughs> Let's talk about this Death, Love, and Robots show. All right. It's almost well, was, good. Uh, so this is an anthology, an animated anthology on Netflix. It just came out this past week. Have you guys seen any of these? No. Okay. I, 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 I know there's a thing. Uh, they're, they're, they're half-baked short stories. Uh, the animation's great. Um, remind, I, I don't, I can't tell if it's just that I'm old, that I'm annoyed by the unnecessary cursing and genitalia in over-the-top blood. There are boobies in, I've watched like eight of these, seven of them have like boobies. And, 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 uh, virtually none of them are integral to the, to the show. Um, yeah. the, uh. Uh, it's almost like animators like drawing boobs. <laughs> could be, could be. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I found I, it's it's that random reinforcement where it's like every third one you finish, you're like, well, that was that was kind of fun. There's something in there. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then uh, and and then you know I've gone back and rewatched a few of them. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, it's it's I, I have a complicated relationship. I've only watched the first uh, five of the anthology, but um, everyone's talking about it, so you should check it out. And uh, I'll tell you right now, um, they're not all great. In fact, some are really bad. Some yeah. some are just awful. Some of them are over, and you're just like, at no point did anybody say this is a bad idea and we should stop doing this. Yeah, there's it's it's a lot of uh, it feels like a lot of trying to really want to be Philip K. Dick or or the Animatrix or Heavy Metal or well, know. I mean, in terms of writing, in terms of like, oh no, we're gonna have. The big, the big twist at the end, and you're like, and everyone see you always see it coming because we come to expect twists now, or we come to expect the last second my, thing. My 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 favorite. And none of them land. My favorite of the videos mm -hmm. uh, has a totally unnecessary like. <gasps> Do you get it? This is where it took place. It's like, yeah, <laughs> dummy. I'm obviously. I've, I've been, I'm alive in the 21st century. I yeah. can see that this is where it took place. Yeah. Anyway. So uh, there are good bits. I re I know you don't like the robots one. The the um, the, the three robots the three grew robots. on me as I watched it. Like there's a lot of it that sort of fell flat and sideways. But but for what it is, three robots. I mean, and 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 it's a corny ending. It's a it's like they just gave yeah, up. Like it's another bad. The, they went for, they went for ten minutes and they were like, yeah. I don't know. Let's just Lord end it like this. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a middling pick for Love, Death, and Robots. Uh, well, I, I do feel like it's important. I don't know. It, worth there watching. stuff. Worth yeah. watching. And they're uh, short. They're like 10 to 15 minute yeah. shorts. So I loved get Suits. I loved Suits for what it was. Sure. Not the USA show. Suits. No. Yeah. I mean actual I suits. Shout out, to, shout out to Prince Harry. I mean lawsuits. <laughs> hmm. Any other picks for after things? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to Brown Paper Tickets for uh, sending the check for the money that we made. Yeah, also shout out to hsreplay.net, uh, helping me out with my Hearthstone game. On the flagpole. I, uh, I'm going to pick one of the Masters of Scale podcast episodes, and I would say, you know, um, the one with, I think it's from the guy who, uh, one of the creators of Instagram, check that out. It's a really good, really, really good sort of dive into because there's not as much talked about Instagram. Kevin Systrom, that's the name. Um, not as much talk about, you know, we don't know as much about that as, let's say, other ones. And then I would say the interview with Ev Williams is good about the the where tw like man, like you forget the history of Twitter where like Ev Williams starts blogger, right? Starts blogger, kind of big phenomenal thing. He starts blogger, not, you know, and then he he <laughs> there's a day where like they're running out of money. You know, it's growing, but it's not making revenue. And so he, he, he or he's starting to you know work on this thing. He calls everybody in who is working with him on it. He's like, hey, we can't pay you anymore. If you can show up tomorrow, that'd be great. Next day, nobody shows up. But he keeps working on Blogger and eventually sells it to Google. And Google buys Blogger. He works for Google for a number of years. And then he decides, hey, podcasting's a big thing. He goes off and he starts Odeo. Remember Odeo? Mm-hmm. You know, and so Odeo is going to redo podcasting, and they're getting ready to you know launch that. But then Apple starts em Apple embraces podcasting and iTunes before anybody even thought they would, and Odeo is kind of like ah, it's going to be harder. But he started at Odeo because he's thinking, you know, podcasting is is that's the future because writing you know writing these blog posts is a lot of work, but if you just use your voice, it's easy. Who has to put production value into that? And so anyhow, the evolution from there to you know from there to Odeo to Twitter, all that's interesting. So I'd recommend. 
that. One, right two. on. And then medium. He comes up medium, and he just keeps come back thinking about the same idea. It's there. So it's been after. <laughs> Everybody, you, get, you both have this face. This. No, no, no. I yeah. I just I don't I don't know. Um... Uh, that well, that, that's that moment where it's just like, uh, uh, like that that like oh wait are we just listing all the things that he came up with <laughs> and, and like i i don't have anything to contribute and so i, I... well i mean I, I i just bring it up because it's like we forget the memory hole you look at yeah. this one guy did all of these things and that's to me that's amazing yeah you absolutely. know you think of one guy one but i'm like oh yeah he did this he did this he did this and it's like i don't know yeah, but hey. nobody cares it's fine i oh, do because uh-huh. we have these ideas all the time I care. You know, it's fine. It's fine. I love it. It's fine. Go back to Peach. Go back to Peach. <laughs> uh, Peach was, I don't know if you guys saw it like a month or so ago. Peach was out there like asking like, hey. They crowdfunded. If anybody They're wants like, to buy hey, Peach. all you Peachers out there, give me a $5. <laughs> yeah. Did they end up doing like a crowdfunding thing? I have thing? no idea. I think they were, they were trying to get bought was their, their tweets. They're they're they're, so they're the best. That's that's when you get the highest price for your product. They started flashing their peach all over, oh. and they're like, "Who wants it?" <laughs> uh, all right, so we got cord killers coming in a bit. Jerry, you, you got Jerry tonight. Three three p.m. Three p.m. Andrew, you gonna do? Got any live streams planned for this week? No, no. Just no. keep a lookout at Andrew Main. Maybe maybe one will show up. No, there won't. <laughs> there we go. Nothing's gonna be at Andrew Maine. Whatever you do, don't look. Don't do it. Uh, alrighty. Well, uh, until then, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. See ya.